Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. Today we are thrilled to welcome a legendary cartoonist, writer for Mad Magazine for close to 60 years, the creator of the fantastically funny comic Gru the Wanderer, winner of every major award in his field, including the National Cartoonist Society Rubin Award and the Will Eisner Hall of Fame Award. Please help us welcome the world's fastest cartoonist, Sergio Aragones. Sergio, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you, thank you. To, yeah, to start with, when you say when you say the the fastest cartoonist, that's not true. You know, I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I draw fast because the style allows it. You know, I mean, it is a, if you have to do like if you draw Superman or Tarzan or anything, you have to be good because a hand has to look like a hand. But when you do cartoons, you can draw a few sausages and that's a hand you know but the speed works with the style but that thing about the fastest is because when we do a a, a presentation on, on a theater or in a comic convention something you don't want the people to get bored right. so you grow <laughs> pretty fast and change it because it's not a permanent thing you know it's just an exhibit you <laughs> drawing and people get very excited. Oh, well, yeah, I can draw that because I always draw the same thing. Alfred Newman, Groom, myself, whatever. But it, I take a lot of time drawing. You know? I mean, it's sure. not fast. It takes <laughs> research alone. Whoa, forget it. <laughs> no, no. Well, well I'll, I'll start. I'll start with one of the questions here. Like to start with, you were born in Spain during the time of the Spanish Civil War. So I, I was reading that your father actively was working behind the scenes against Franco? Well, yeah, all the, the Spanish, all the people who like the Republic, who was taken by the fascist Franco, who was helped by Hitler, you know, so every Spaniard fought. My mother and I, we, we left to seek refuge in France, you know, and uh, we were there in uh, the section that sadly was run by the Germans, which is called the Vichy mm -hmm. section of Vichy France. France. So we were there, and uh, I don't remember anything. I was six months old when I left Spain, but I was there until 1942. So that later years, I remember I went to element, well, no elementary, but uh, sort of like a kindergarten type of mm -hmm. school. You know, so it was it was hard. Sure, it was hard being hit, and then out, my father joined uh, by 1940. My sister was born around that time, so. mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was well, it was it was bad times. Yes. Um, well, you know, so I mean, you are in France, like during the height of Hitler's presence in Europe. Oh, yeah. Is there any recollections you you, you have about that? I mean, yes. you said you were very young when you moved there, but yes. what was that like? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm, school, you know, you know, and uh, it was the the lack of things, you know. I mean, the, the, for instance, I I. I loved to draw since I was very, very young. I had pencils and I stuff, but there was no paper. So I will draw, they will get me some books, families will pass books and things. And I will draw on the books. There was some cartoon books and mm -hmm. I will draw on the drawings. <laughs> Just <laughs> draw on the, on the books. So, it, but what I remember is something that lasted a long time it was the fear. Because that's my mother, she so she she got so scared every time an airplane passed, even when we were already safe in Mexico. Mm. At that early time, I remember having that every time she heard a plane, she will hide under the table. You know, mm. it was like you know, that's that type of fear of of what the horrors of first on Spain and then in France. You know, but well, it was it was bad times. So you, so you were in France till only till forty two. That's... 1942, yes, and then we uh, we left by ship, you know, and uh, arrived in Mexico, and that was 
uh, the, the, Mexico was one of the very few government who accepted refugees during the war. Okay. And opened their arms because um, the language and everything. Mm -hmm. and, well, yeah, uh, we were we were going to ask you what what prompted the decision to to move to Mexico, and that makes a great deal of sense. Because it was a, a safe escape. You know, many other mm -hmm. countries returned ships back to Europe. They didn't want. Sure. It was a, a very difficult time. The fear of communism, the fear of of a, a lot of people that coming from another country. You know, it was it was hard. But Mexico opened the guard, gave us some money, put us in apartments. You know, in groups. You know, there were not only one family, one apartment. There were a few. And um, I went to school. I didn't spoke Spanish at all. I spoke French. <laughs> My my parents figured it out that eventually we were going to if 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 Franco lose the war, we will go back to Spain. So or we'll go to another Spanish speaking country, <laughs> and uh, so French was my first language. Uh, I arrived to Mexico and it was, uh, you know, when you're a kid and and you're afraid of things, you just start drawing and forget about everything around you you know so well that's true i mean this this is your third country already and you were still a little kid yeah i've been a refugee already from uh, france to mexico and to the united states <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh it, but, uh, so how, how difficult was that for you as a kid i mean was it hard <laughs> like making friends coming into a new country and it was hard. It, I I didn't want to go out, of course, in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I, I stayed in the apartment and I drew. And I saw my mother was a seamstress. So I, she will give me a, a little ring and I will make a drawing and start, you know, start sewing, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, th that was just because there was no other things to do. And when I went out, the kids will make fun of, of my accent because I barely was learning and you pick it very fast because you, your family speak it. So you, you, it was almost instant that I, I pick up Spanish. And, uh, but the difference was my parents spoke Castilian Spanish. So uh -huh. when I spoke with the Zeta, Z, 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 my, the kids in, in Mexico make fun of me. So when I spoke mm -hmm. Mexican with, with an S instead of the Zeta, my parents will get mad at me, so it was, <laughs> yeah. I got to remember what, what Spanish I'm speaking now. Right. So, but, uh, but it was a, a very happy family, you know. No, I, there was no hazard. My father find work immediately. Uh, there were all kinds of jobs at the beginning, and uh, but then he became mm -hmm. an extra in a movie because he read on the newspaper mm -hmm. that Spanish-looking actors or extras for a movie about the Spanish independence. So they needed a, the Spanish army against the Mexican army. So they needed lo Spanish looking people. So Amazing. As, my, as he's being told, my father arrived very happy. He says, this is it. I'm becoming an actor because they play very well and I don't have to do anything. You know? so I just stand up there. <laughs> so he got into the movie industry from amazing the, yeah. as an extra, then as an <laughs> actor, then he got into production of it, <laughs> and he ended up as, as a movie producer. Yeah. Hmm. So was, well, so you, very, very you normal, you, a happy, a happy childhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. You, you said you started drawing in a at, a at a very early age what do you recall like what prompted you to move that direction or was it just sort of an organic thing that that, that came to you there was nothing else to do because <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we all do when there's nothing else to do we just pick up a pen and start making art or pencil <laughs> mine was an art I, I was never good as an artist as a kid but i grew all the time all my yeah. school books have drawings all over, doing math, doing everything. Everything is covered with drawings. <laughs> First, they were drawings like airplanes dropping bombs and tanks, you know, uh. things. And slowly, it was copying all the 
cartoons that I like who were really funny animals. I never read any superheroes in Mexico. At that time, they were not exported except uh, Batman or uh, I remember liking but because of the of the drawings, but we we're ahead of time. I wasn't not a kid. I was already growing up. Mm -hmm. And um, because I drew all the time in class, always in trouble with the teachers. <laughs> but I learned how to pay attention to class while drawing. And the teachers get really mad because they saw me like that, not paying attention. What I just said, oh, you say that this, the river goes away. <laughs> Drop them nuts, you know, that I was really paying attention. The drawing, oh, that's so fantastic! Instinctive, the drawing has been always there since I remember. Huh. Well, you mentioned you mentioned your dad being in the in the TV business and the production film production business. Oh, now, one of the things I found TV didn't has, exist then. well, but you, he worked on now, is this, he worked on the series The Sheena and the Jungle Queen. Is that so? Oh, no, that, that that's another very funny thing. I I I have always loved streaming and scuba diving. That okay. has been my, my sport since very kid. So we were in a town called. Um, I'm going to forget a lot of names because nope. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting, but um, it's a place with a very beautiful river going on. I, I used to go there to train, to, to uh, swimming there because you could swim against the current and it, there was trees under the water and stuff. So it was a, a very entertaining. My father was then, um, he wasn't yet a, a producer. He was sort of like a manager, production manager or something like that mm -hmm. for a series that they were shooting in China. Right. I was there because I went there every time we have time. It wasn't that far from Mexico City. It was so with my friends to dive. And uh, they were shooting a scene of China jumping on the water. And because she wasn't there, I never met her. But I never met her. the stunt woman didn't show up. <laughs> and they were there shooting a, a few eggs. So my father, big mouth, goes, oh, my son is a great diver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, they, because it was a long shot, they gave <laughs> me the costume, you know, the wig. <laughs> I had to jump on the water from a, from a, a what do we call in Spanish, una liana, you know, a Tarzan type of thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> from the bar. Like that, and die, you know, it's a very simple thing. So, all my friends were in the floor laughing, of course. But, uh, That's but, great. <laughs> so, we did it, you know, I, I was on the tree, I, I took the, the, the rope, I went up, went up, and, 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 and go, you know, very interesting. God, so the week was a mess, and the whole thing, and says, you want to do it, we have to do it again? The, the guy says, no, we got it, and that was it. <laughs> the whole participation in China, going in the jungle. But my father was on yeah. the... The, the, the Mexican production company was Ismael Rodriguez. Rodriguez brothers were the, okay. the guys. That were. Uh, there's a contract with by the unions that if you shoot in Mexico, you have to use the equivalent on Mexican. Mm -hmm. on. So if you have a, a shooting, him, you have to use Mexican, uh, the same equivalent of cameraman and, and the staff and the whole the whole thing. So the, they were. My father was on the Mexican side of the of the production, and it was directed by Ismael Rodriguez, who was my father worked for for that company for many years. So it was a lot of fun, and I was big fun with my. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's such a unique experience of being on a on a film set. Period, because that's what my I grew up doing that, and and, and that was my career. Um, it's so much fun and you literally got thrown into it. So <laughs> did you, after that experience, did you ever consider going into film um, well, instead of child, art? A, a child extra. My father was an extra and every time they needed kids, there's my sister and I as extras <laughs> playing in the garden. <laughs> with this and that. So we were, uh, we make our first help in the household with uh, being extras. But the the, the thing is that because, for instance, the, the school bus will drive me to the studios. Mm -hmm. 
and I will go in and I will play on the sets. They were a lot of fun. I, my father would go and say, did you, did you homework? And yes, or if I haven't, I did it very quick. And then I spend the whole time. Then my father and I will walk to, my father built a house by then and it behind the, the, the studio, Churubusco. And they have a special door on the back so we could get out through there. And uh, we walk, we walk home, we have dinner, and that was it. So I stayed, I spent more time on the, the sets than any other logical kid. <laughs> People at, at the at the, the, the when they have the, the guns and all that, the props, they knew me very well because the first thing I did was grab some Western guns and put them on, you know, and, and go and play on the on the on the on the uh, Western village that was built on Churubusco. And I, I played just by myself all the time with the guns and I will open the bar door and there was nothing there, of course. We're just a prop, you know. But I, I got always shot and I would go back, <laughs> fell on, you know, the bar where they tie the horses. And I would back and fall down. And then again, I did another scene. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I love the studio. That's great. <laughs> Once they make a movie about um, Squadron 201, who was an airplane force that was sent during the Second World War mm -hmm. to help the war, Mexico enter. And uh, they made a movie about that battalion, but that squadron called the 201 mm -hmm. that they sent to, to the war. And they made a movie and there was a big plane there in the set. And that was a lot of fun because I, between scenes when they were shooting, I, I will play there and when they, the pilot, the actor pilot came in to shoot the, the scenes, I was behind the seat just looking. The, old, the play was kind of old by then and I could look through the little rivets that they were missing at the camera. Huh. I had a great time at the, at the, at the That's set. That's fantastic. <laughs> it was a great experience. Yeah. Now, now, as far as your art, who, who were some of your influences as a kid that made you think that this is what I want to do? I never thought that that's what I want to do. Really? Okay. What's the difference mm. with the other, other cartoonists who knew, for instance, my friend and, and colleague, Mark Evanier, mm -hmm. at age six, he knew he wanted to be a writer because he loved reading and says, this is what I want to do. I never thought I was going to be a cartoonist for many reasons. First, I'm talking so early in life that uh, young people don't remember in the fifties, we were obedient to our parents. Mm -hmm. So if your parent says, you have to be an engineer, that's what you were going to be. You never doubted because when, when you are a, an immigrant, the only thing you want is to prove that immigration works. And the only way to do that is by your sons being better than anything else. So nobody can say, oh, he left for this and that. You, if you are a successful immigrant, you want your sons to be something. You don't care that much about yourself. My father was really caring about my sister and I to become something. So he was very much against me drawing because he never met a cartoonist who make a decent living at that time in Mexico. You know, I mean, they were very badly paid and they mm -hmm. were exploited by the companies that make comics. and. Every time he hired a cartoonist, he was just for a kind of a very low type of work. So no way I was going to be work cartoonist. And he really re didn't like me drawing because okay. I had to be an engineer, which I, I went to college and in, uh, to as engineering school. And just because I had to, and I did, I went to my, ha my, my parents, to my father, about three months later, and says, Dad, Papa, I don't understand anything. I don't understand a wow. word of engineering. I cannot do this, you know. Oh, but I, when I, I, when I went to to engineering, and I would leave because it, there was no point in me attending these classes. So I went to architecture, who was the next school next to it in the University City. We're talking nineteen fifty. 55 mm -hmm. and I will go to architecture and I liked it a lot. So I told him, look, I won't be an engineer. I'll be an architect. I like architecture. 
So that was okay. So I went to architecture school. And of course, I spent the whole day, time in the theater group and all this story of architecture. <laughs> but I never thought I was going to be <clears throat> honest professionally. And I have, mm -hmm. we have to go back because when I was in, uh, in high school, I drew for the newspaper, mm -hmm. the school newspaper. And uh, that was the beginning of, of my career as a cartoonist. But I never intended to be a cartoonist. It was something that it was very easy for me to draw. Jokes, I was always making fun of things and making drawings <laughs> of people, you know. But well, uh, you, I never thought I was going to become a cartoonist. When you mentioned architecture school, so that's, you, you met uh, Marcel Marceau there and you, it, it was at Alejandro Jodorowsky? Khodorovsky, yeah, uh, that was very fascinating because once in architecture, I was I went a lot to the swimming pool because I was not a very good student. You know? So the theater <laughs> fascinated me for many logical reasons. In Mexico, it's very difficult to date girls because they take it very seriously. And when you want to date a girl, oh. They send a chaperone. Sometimes it was an aunt or a brother or something. But when you're in the theater group, the girls are more free. They love to, they rehearse sometimes until two o'clock in the morning. So it was great. You could go with coffee with the girls. And, <laughs> and the, the theater fascinated me, not because the acting or anything, it's because it was a great fun to be with the actors and with the girls. And it started because my friends who on architecture, they were part of the theater, Hector Ortega, who became a top uh, actor in Mexico. I would finish class and I will go to the theater where they were rehearsing and I will mm -hmm. sit there. And of course, Sergio, somebody didn't show up. Can you read? Sure. Who are you? I'm Maria. Okay. <laughs> and they will go and whatever part it was then I will read it. and. So I was part of the theater group. It was a lot of fun. I did theater. Marcel Marceau comes to, to Mexico because we're in the theater group. We can go and see it. So I was fascinated by pantomime mm -hmm. because it was so logical for cartooning. You know, I mean, the guy was doing things that I was doing in my head when I was drawing things. You know, this, the pantomime was like boom, a magic seeing seeing these men doing pretending that it was a, a rope and, and and things you know and that's what you needed you know, it was great so they asked me because i spoke french to to introduce Marceau to the group the theater group and oh, make wow. the translation so i said sure no no problem so one day when went out and uh, Khodorovsky was one of the mimes helping Marceau Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, what Ale, Alejandro Khodorovsky did and the other mime was bring a sign that we, they would say the magician and did a little pantomime and then the, Marceau will come in and did his part so he said uh, you don't have to translate I'm from Chile I speak Spanish and he was Marceau's assistant so it was perfect so we sat there listening to Khodorovsky translating from, from Marceau and so it was a great pleasure meeting that uh, fantastic mime, you know, a great gentleman. And uh, whatever they didn't understand uh, from Khodorovsky, I will help the guys, you know, but not that much at all. It was not needed. Mm -hmm. But Khodorovsky, they, they asked Marceau to stay in Mexico to, to give a few conferences and teach mime, but he couldn't because Marceau had all his schedule already uh -huh. done, you know, for many countries to visit. But Alejandro stayed, Alejandro Khodorovsky, and he opened a pantomime school, which my friends attended, Hector and some of the other guys. And I, I figured, I, well, this can help me a lot with the cartoons, huh. you know, learning. So I, I asked Khodorovsky that I would like to attend, not because I wanted to be a mime, because I was a little tall for the average mime, you know, and a little too, too sport-like to, to be a delicate mind. So, <laughs> so, but I said, because I want to apply it to my cartoons. And he loved the idea because he was a, 
a, a writer of, of comics in his head and he could draw. So we had a good rapport with Alejandro I oh, had for many, many years to this day. He's in his 90s now. I haven't talked to him for a while. but So he stayed open. I, I attended. I learned pantomime. I did. When we did a theater of pantomime, I presented a group with my drawings. I had a hmm. big glass and I will go in white face and whatever the, the other actors' minds were going to do, I will draw it instead of bringing a card saying that drunk or the old man that, that stares. I will go and draw it, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, it was a great time. This was, <laughs> well, uh, what will be these uh, late 50s? Right. Yeah, late, late 50s. Yeah. Yeah. So is... I was doing that and pretending I went to school. <laughs> and my parents <laughs> never caught on that. By now, I've, I've been in the school since 1955, <laughs> like three years going to college, you know. But for them, they were happy, you don't know. <laughs> so there, there was a, a, a great time. Uh, and I did cartoon by then. By, I was a cartoonist. I, okay. I, I spent the whole time trying to publish. I got a weekly page in one of the leading magazines. And I did my pantomime cartoons. So I became a cartoonist almost by default, you know, by, because I love that career so much. Never thought of it as a that I, I could make a living out of it, which I couldn't. In the magazine I was working was one of the leading magazines. I have a weekly page and I was pay, getting paid the equivalent of $8 hmm. for page. You know. So I, I figured it out what will be the other alternative. I figured out, well, I have to get out of here. Sadly, I have to go. And there was two options to go to France because I love the French cartoons, the French cartoons. They did a lot of pantomime cartoons okay. or the United States because there was all the comic strip that I read in Mexico and the comics and everything. So, so that, that's that's what made you go to the United States because of the comics you wanted to do comics then? No comics, but cartoons. Cartoons, right, right. Yeah. And it was it was hard because um Am I talking too much? Or it's, it's, no. Oh, no. Not. Oh, my Lord. Where, where, where? There, was, there was a magazine yeah. called um, <laughs> Writer's Digest. Mm -hmm. and the Writer's Digest was a, 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 a weekly or, yeah, it was a weekly. And it, it, it listed all the magazines of what articles they bought. So a magazine will say, uh, and they say, gentlemen, we need uh, cartoons with boys and girls. Uh, we pay so much. We 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 are we look Wednesdays or Thursdays, and uh, right now we're not buying because we have too many. Or here you have to talk. So at the end of the magazine, who talked to writers, there was a cartoonist guide. Mm -hmm. was, he was like, oh, I have to go to every of these magazines. And it was pretty bad because nobody liked my cartoons. You know, in those times they like cartoons with words. You know, there, there was all the magazine cartooning, who was very popular then, Luke, uh, 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 Gentleman, Capers, Capade, all the magazines had cartoons, but they liked the cartoons with words. When I will present my cartoon, they will look for the words. You know. <laughs> It's a it's a pantomime joke, no words. Um, <laughs> we don't publish that. And it was oh my god. I sold a few. You did. Uh, one day they liked uh, my drawings. They didn't like my gags, so they wanted me to modernize some old cartoons, make them more modern. So I got hired to doing that, copying old cartoons and making them more modern. So it was a, a very joke, which, and then I went to Squire. And they bought two cartoons, but they, as in, even in my presence, they says, oh, this will be very good for so-and-so. And I, to me, I have never separated the drawing from the writing of the drawing. So I, I didn't know, but they bought my cartoons for somebody else to draw. Yeah, well. And I didn't want to sell them. And this was the Squire, was the top magazine. I says, no, 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 I draw. 
no, you, my English was even worse than now. They, they, they say, uh, no, no, we give it to our staff cartoonists. You know, this cartoon is very well known. I knew the name of the cartoon. No, no, it's my, my, I draw it. It's my cartoon. You know? Well, no, we cannot buy it. Well, I don't sell it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand the system. You know? And many magazines always told me, this is crazy. You should go to Mad Magazine. <laughs> Had you been aware of Mad Magazine at the time? Yes. Yeah. I didn't read it because I didn't spoke any English. So <laughs> I will draw the, the guys at high school, the, the senior high, because the magazine, I, I didn't arrive that early to Mexico, for them to translate for me. But they would run away because the English in mad is not the English that the kids learn in school. It's a very difficult <laughs> English. So when they saw me with a mad magazine, all my English speaking guys will run away. <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't read math, I, I, no, no way. I, but I love the drawings; they were just amazing drawings. So after a while in the states, I figured out, well, this is it. I mean, I cannot make a living here. But everybody says go to math. Well, I'm going, but to set, to see the guys, I wanted to meet the cartoonists at math. Because hmm. right, right now I have met a few of the freelancing cartoonists, and. Uh, Every Wednesday, when we did the rounds to sell cartoons, at the end you'll go to a bar or a restaurant when they have dinner, and I will join them. And they treat me great. All the all the That's great. they were so generous with their explanations and what to do and how to do it. The the other cartoonists that you met. Yes, oh, they were terrific. Yeah. Had a few beers there and talk about cartooning and where to go. And mad when I mention mad, they says no, no, that that's a close shop, you know. So it says well, at least everybody says go to mad, so I'm going to mad. So I went, you know. I was very fortunate. <laughs> how did you? I mean, how did you make your way in um, to the magazine? I the, when I arrived there, I didn't know what to do. You know, the reception says yes, and I said Antonio Proias, I. The guy who drew Spy was a Spy, because mm -hmm. I knew his work from Mexico, because he drew in, in Cuban magazines, and he was very cruel cartoonist. I mean, the, the humor was very, very black, very dark, you know? <laughs> and but he was very good cartoonist, very stylized. So I asked for his name because I knew he did Spy was a Spy, and uh, he was there. So he came out. My brother, he was so <laughs> amazing gentleman, you know, he says, so we, we talked for a while, you know, he says, oh, you have to meet the guys here, they are terrific, all this in Spanish. I says, well, can you introduce me to them? And he says, no, you have to introduce yourself because I don't speak English either. So <laughs> that, was, that was it, you know. So he, he went back and brought uh, Jerry DeFuccio and Nick Meglin, who were the, the assistant editors to to Felstein mm -hmm. and uh, they he introduced me as his brother my brother from Mexico you know. so ah, very glad to meet you Mr. Proias <laughs> and I will say no Proia Aragonés so to them that means like a sneeze or something because they keep calling me Proias you know. no 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 Aragonés <laughs> that, that didn't until they realized that was my name you know. it's, oh they of course, yeah. So it was, it was. <laughs> so they took the cartoons inside, and uh, Felsi came out with them and said, uh, "We'd like to buy two pages <laughs> with your cartoons." And I was like, mm. "It was amazing." You know? And uh, they had another uh, sell. I had a, a lot of cartoons about astronauts, so they bought the cartoons. They, mm -hmm. they were completely separate, single guy cartoons, and says this this will make a, a two pager article. So they bought, and they gave me a, a, a check that was, in that time, was fifty dollars per art mm -hmm. and fifty dollars per cartoon, when the majority of cartoons were making like six dollars and seven dollars. Mm -hmm. So I got a hundred dollars a page, and they so too. So I have a two hundred dollar. I've never seen in my life that much money. You know. <laughs> 1952. Huh. That was a lot of money. 
and uh, they, they had both articles. And, and Jerry DeFuccio, who was one of the editors, became a dear friend after that, uh, that I became part of the group. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, you have a couple of cartoons here about motorcycle cops. Why don't you bring another article about motorcycle cops? Maybe he felt think we like it and make another two page. I said, sure. I went to, I was staying in some place, which I don't want to mention, but next day I was at the office before they opened. So I'm standing there and says, what are you doing here? What do you want? So I have the article you asked me about and they couldn't believe it that I have done 20 cartoons about Astrum, about motorcycle cops one night. And uh, they bought it. <laughs> this is this is amazing. You know, they, they usually a cartoonist will take a long time to, to do an article. You know, you have to yeah. think the guys. But being pantomime cartoons, I was there the morning. I didn't sleep, of course. But uh, they loved it. They loved it. And they bought it. <laughs> and <laughs> that's... They they bought a few more for cover ideas. They liked the guy they Alfred Newman, of course. Of course, <laughs> next day I was there with about twenty ideas for covers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they 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 I uh, I did I did very good from the beginning. You know, the, the, well, yeah. what what were your first impressions of of Bill Gaines? Oh, he was a, a, a very jolly old old. He was probably in forties. A very nice gentleman, big gentleman. He laughed a lot, you know. He was a, a great friend. But my problem is I could never call Felstein Ow. He was Mr. Felstein and Mr. Gaines. And every time I talk to them, I will say, oh, good morning, Mr. Gaines. This is Bill. You call me Bill. And I couldn't. <laughs> I was already uh, an adult, you know. And... I couldn't, I, it was so hard for me to call them by the first name. That doesn't happen. It's sort of like a lack of respect in, in, oh, in certain sure. countries. Sure. You know, I, I couldn't. So it was Mr. Gaines and Felsen, and they laughed. You know, just, call me Al, call me Bill. Until <laughs> one day I went, hey, Bill, and it hurts. You know, just, can I call you Bill? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, they became dear, dear, dearest friends, all of them. Well, you, you've been very complimentary of, of uh, Bill Gaines. I mean, you, you had about the relationship in the past. I've seen that you've talked uh, very uh, nicely about him. Yeah, he, he was uh, such a, it's like your crazy uncle, you know, that you love. And <laughs> you cannot deal with things about talking about monies or, or doing things. He, a lot of people think he was a cheap person. Because they said, oh, he he was every cent he wanted to 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 find out. He wa- he was a, a a chemistry teacher. When his father died, who was the creator of the comics, Max Gaines, mm-hmm. you know the story probably better than I do. That that uh, he was he liked everything that had to match. So he spent a lot of time matching things, like the telephone bill. So if he didn't match, he knew that there was some discrepancy there. And he, who, he'll go, who called New Jersey? And Jerry says, I did. Well, you owe me 60 cents. <laughs> just, he, he had these things, but it was not for the money. It was just that he wanted to, because he invited us to, to, to trips every year. We went to Africa, we went to Spain, all over the world, safaris, uh, Name it, it was just fantastic. And we had meals that you wouldn't believe. He'll go one day and invited you to taste some wines because he loved wine. Uh, he was become a member of that uh, group that had that little thing to taste wines, you know. And he'll, he'll spend with you a bottle of uh, 200 bucks just to taste with you guys. He, he was not a cheap guy at all. Hmm. He, he was quirk, uh, strange. He had a set of clothing, three sizes. When he buy a shirt, he buy a small, a medium, and a large. Because his f- weight fluctuated. <laughs> he liked that shirt. <laughs> Whatever weight he has, he had the same shirt, you know. 
and he That's never wore a tie and he will go to a restaurant and says you have to wear a tie and says i'm not wearing a tie that's ridiculous he <laughs> said well then we cannot serve you so he'll call all his friends says this restaurant doesn't allow me to go to a tie and then people like the the, the that had other magazines they will call and said i want to make a reservation i'm the president of this company or the publisher i want to make a reservation for 20 people you know and uh i heard that we have to wear ties yes well cancel it i'll go to another restaurant and he did, did that with all his friends you know so <laughs> so next time he they they call him and says oh you can come without a tie sir <laughs> <laughs> so he was an amazing character and a dear dear friend yeah how did you how did you work in the marginal start well that was another thing that uh, they that before i was there they had little signs if you look at the very old magazines mm -hmm. referring to to books or to theater they will have a little comment a little but it was written and when I was re learning English and looking at the maths, I will go to Jerry and say, what this means, you know, the little sign. Mm -hmm. And says, uh, did you read uh, o. Henry's uh, Tropical Cancer? No. Well, then you will not understand this. Oh, have you seen that movie, da, da, da? No. Well, you will not understand this. So I figured out what to put things that I don't understand. This would be perfect to put little cartoons. So I, did, I drew the little cartoons call them up and paste them up in top of the signs in one magazine. You know? <laughs> and I went to the publisher, to the editor, to Al Felsi, and I says, look at this issue. And why? No, just look at it. You know? So he went, you know, and finished and says, what is there to look? You know, no, 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 look at the corner, look at the corners. So he went, and suddenly he saw the little cartoons, you know. The, and then he started seeing that there were gags there. And he laughed, you know. And then they had a meeting, you know, and uh, they said, well, can, can you do this every issue? He says, of course. So from that moment, I started drawing the marginals. Hmm. And years later, they, Jerry told me, he says, well, the constant one says, this is really funny, but nobody can draw cartoons that size, that many, every issue, you know. And... Uh, and it says, well, the, the funny, let's run until he runs out of ideas. It's, <laughs> I'm still once in a while drawing for the new <laughs> margin. 50 <of> years later. <laughs> 60 years later. <laughs> well, I've drawn thousands and thousands. Of them. But, oh my uh, God. It, was, um, it was a lot of fun. It was mm, what I did. You know? And then I stopped being a, a freelance cartoonist because I had enough, I had a lot of work just for mm -hmm. my own. Mm. And I did some other jobs, freelancing, you know, like uh, covers for things. And uh, uh, there was a, a, a company then called uh, the, uh, the American Forum, or something like that, that did booklets for relation between management and employees. And I did a lot of illustrations for the books. Mm. There was a, a doctor who did uh, invented a, a thing called a tonometer for glaucoma, and he needed a brochure in humor to explain how to use it. So I worked <laughs> with the inventor of the tonometer for glaucoma. So I did a booklet for him, and like that, I illustrated a few books for a writer called Betty Rowland, "Mothers Are F Funnier Than Children." Uh, another book was called. Uh, Eight Secrets of Success. And I, I did book illustration. I did a children's book illustration and a, a lot of work. I, I got a lot of work. Mm. So that was it. That was the beginning. I never went hungry. It <laughs> was straight. But and well, my how... parents came to visit one day at, at MAD and uh, they realized that I was doing pretty good. Well, that's that's certainly good to know. Oh, so, how, how how long was it? Uh, did it take before, like, from doing the marginals to getting your own features in in Mad? 
it was almost instantly because the first issue that came out because this is in 62 mm -hmm. and they were ahead a few months with the magazines you know and they had a date on the cover that had to stay longer on the stands so the first issue that i saw in in the summer of 62 came out in 63 on the cover so mm. for for logical reasons my start with mad is in 63 even though in 62 i was already selling a lot of material for them but to me that's my beginning is in 62 with mad but for the normal person who read the magazine the cover the first issue that i work the cover was my idea, mm -hmm. the two-page article, and the marginals. And from now on, you know, and there's a book about covers, and I'm, I, I have brought many of the cover ideas. You know, that was mm -hmm. a lot of fun too. That's a good well, book, Mad Covers. Yes. <laughs> Uh, in the late sixties, you you started working at DC Comics. You were mostly involved in their humor titles like Jerry Lewis, Angel and the Ape. How did you become involved with them? Well, that's a that's a funny story too. Uh, <laughs> Joe Orlando was one of the mad cartoonists, and being from Italian descent, we have become very good friends. You know, we went out for dinner and stuff, and he was married to. Gloria Orlando, who was Bill Gaines secretary. Oh. So <laughs> I went to, to Europe for a couple of years to meet cartoonists. By now I could, I was kind of established. This is in 60, what we have been, 66, 65, 66 and 67. Mm -hmm. My birthday was, I was in Spain in September of uh, 67, yeah, 66 and 67. So when I came back, I go to Mad, of course, say hello. And I asked for uh, for uh, Jorlando and says, well, he he's, he's not publishing with Mad anymore. And uh, it was a very, very nice thing that, that happened there. So it says, what happened? Well, he's now an editor at DC. Mm. So, DC was very close from Mad. I go to D to DC, say hello to to Joe, you know, and he was there with a, a, a an artist. Um, I forget the name right now. And uh, they were waiting for the writer to bring a story for Young Romance. And he was there, you know, and the guy has to go back, and says, well. Why don't you go to lunch and when you come back I I'll give you the, the the stories. Oh great. They didn't ask anything because I was already with Matt, so they left. So I went to the library of DC, looked for young romance. I read a couple of them and they all were the same, you know. <laughs> the, the, the guy <laughs> meets a girl, they fall in love, then they separated, she cries, then he comes back and they're happily <laughs> forever after, you know. That's easy. So I I wrote a story, you know, how I met my first wife. Instead of a cartoonist, I was a Maria, a music maker in Mexico. And then, <laughs> then I leave and she's crying. Then I come back and they are happily. But because I don't write English, I drew it. I took eight by eleven page. This is what I do with Gru too, you know. <laughs> I, I I I I write Gru in a way you know like uh, like like this you know mm -hmm. with, with the drawings oh wow well. you know but my english is still very quick not as it should be for a writer you know and mark Ivanir writes so well you know he's such a good writer and uh, he changes a lot of things too because of the continuity he's a great editor great writer Mm -hmm. And many times we have sat together in a coffee house for a, and he says, well, what about if we do something about uh, a guy who his name is also Gru? Oh, that's great. Yeah. So I go and write the story that he writes it right. But it's, it's already drawn, you know. It's, so I did that with uh, with uh, Jorlando. And uh, 
I uh, so when they, he came back and says, well, here's two stories. Says, oh, you, the artist was delighted. Oh man, you save me a lot of time. I don't have to, 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 to go to all the descriptions of the writers who go, it's at an evening and uh, they are uh, a sunset and the horse and this, this and that character. I just drew it, you know, so <laughs> no explanation. So they loved it. So it says, great. So they gave it to the, to the writer to, to, to do. They love that both stories. And Jot says, I didn't know you write uh, the, the comics. That was really good. And he says, well, neither did I. My, my first work. <laughs> I said, well, really? He says, yeah, I've never written anything before, ever. Except well, my own. <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, drawing just adventures on the backs of papers and things, you know. But that was the beginning. They wanted more. And because it was humor, they gave me the Jerry Lewis, Angel and the Ape. Uh, oh, yeah. But the pay wasn't that good, and it was uh, pretty bad, you know. So I did a few things. Well, was, so you, you you mentioned you mentioned Gru. I I love Gru. I have the very first issue of Gru. <laughs> I love them from the start because I was already a fan of yours from Mad Magazine. I remember picking that up when they first came out. Uh, how did the idea for Gru come about? Well, I. Um... I love comics. I never was a, a superhero fan because I never grew up with them. And uh, in when I was in Europe to meet cartoonists, I met all the guys who were working for Pilot and to Asterisks and all the all the what they call the Dovenaires, the weekly magazines, who are more to child oriented, more youth oriented than adult. And that was, I love those magazines. I was familiar with them. And I went to meet them. You know, I knew the, 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 the publisher, Rene Gossini, which uh, was a friend of Bill Gaines, by the way, I met him in New York with uh, the, the cartoonist from the Monty Python who was the both of them were there to see to see Bill, and I met them in New York. So I went to see say hello to uh, to Rene, and uh, he introduced me cartoonists, and I went there a few days in a row, you know, to see them and meet, have coffee with the guys and stuff. And I realized that everything that they did was in humor. And in the United States, there was no humor in com in comics. There was uh, children's comics, very few. There were funny animals. There were teenager comics, but there were no humor comics at all. Probably there was one that I don't know, but there wasn't. And then I think that humor came with the underground because they did humor, pure humor, good humor, not my subject matter, because they talk about drugs and about sex and about religion things, which is a subject that I barely touch on my cartoons. Mm -hmm. I ne never touch cartoons. But uh, while I was in one of my trips to, 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 to France, I said, I can do comics now because I, 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 this is, and also because all the cartoons in Europe own their own material. The copyright mm. is theirs. And I figured that's it. You know, I mean, this is fantastic. So I had to start thinking of something that there isn't there for comics to write. So the first thing I thought, this this was after. This, I, I, I've been thinking about doing comics, but I never did anything because I didn't know what to do. And uh, in Paris, I, I see an ad for a movie called Torzun, Long de la, de, uh, and said, that, that was my first idea that I got. It was a Tarzan, a silly Tarzan. You know, like they, they were twins. Tarzan was born, but also was his twin brother, but his twin <laughs> brother was very stupid and whatever he did, didn't work. Oh, it was great. So suddenly there it is, a silly Tarzan. I, I went in to look at it and it was a, a pornographic movie. It was horrible. <laughs> oh, 
I, I, I cannot describe how bad it was. <laughs> even even the people at at the, at the Tarzan sued them, you know, the boroughs, <laughs> and it was bad. But I said I cannot do another uh, another funny Tarzan. So I figured out what what is not there, and I figured out there's no humor in barbarians, and I love barbarians. I love Conan, and I love all, uh, that period. I love dinosaurs, and I figured out I can do a cartoon that involves witches and not to draw airplanes or, or, or realistic buildings or anything, but just fun. So I start creating Gru on my head and wrote a lot. I'd make it many drawings of him. And this was in the seventies by now that yeah. I'm doing that. And I went to people and says, I want to publish a, a comic, but I went on the rights. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> that, that, that cannot happen. We 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 like your work. You're great, and we would like to see your comic, and we'll publish it, sure. And uh, but no, no, I went on the rights. No, 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 the rights will be ours. You know, so, mm. so I says, well, I won't sell it. And I had grew in my head ten years before it was published. Mm. Until Pacific Comics came in. Thanks to Mark. Mark has been always very enjoying on the on the thing, and I, I he told me that uh, the, the the copyright could be done with. Uh, he was a friend of mine by now. Never worked with him. He was just a good friend. I I talk. I met him in L.A. when I was living there because he was the president of a of a cartoon club when he was a kid. So he asked me for a lecture. He told me, you know. So I met him as a, as a kid, you know, and uh, he was really a, such a clever man, you know, a clever kid. So uh, when, when did you bring him into Gru? When we talked to Pacific and they said, yes, we like, it. I thought they were only distributors. So I went to them and I uh, says, if, uh, if I publish a, a comic book, will you distribute it for me? And they would say, not only that, we'll publish it. Mm. And then Mark was involved with the, with the whole thing. And uh, I started publishing Grew with Pacific, owning the right. And we did, Mark have asked me to do a cartoon for uh, a benefit comic that they were doing for uh, the gentleman who created uh, what was that? Uh, Destroyer Doc, the comic mm -hmm. Destroyer Doc, which uh, Jack Kirby and many other artists collaborated. And uh, Mark Evanier was working, writing pieces and doing a lot of things for the benefit of, uh, of the rights for um, Howard the Doc mm -hmm. or Steve Gerber's. Uh, fight against Marvel. Right. And he asked, says, I saw that cartoon that you did uh, a few pages about Gru. Can we use it on the on the comic? Destroy your dog? And says, sure. So Mark presented it. He was without words. It was a three or four page. And that was the first appearance. And uh, that was the beginning. Then Pacific started publishing it. And I went to Mark and says, Mark, I, ca I cannot write good English, you know, and uh, says, don't worry, I'll, 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 I'll do the writing, you know, of the story. And he did. I think he even colored one of the earlier issues and letter too. You know, he was just an amazing friend and collaborator. And uh, we've been working together since then. Mm -hmm. and after, after Pacific broke, Eclipse did an issue and we went there with Com uh, the stories that we already had done for Pacific, hmm. for issue number seven, no, eight. I don't remember what issue was. Uh, I think we did six or eight issues from Pacific. That was a long time ago, my God. And then we did one for Eclipse. And then Mark was friends with a, a very nice lady that worked for Marvel. And they said uh, that they were making a new line and then we could keep the rights. 
I said, that's terrific. So we were there and it was published by Marvel. We did 120 issues with them, 10 years in a row, and never missed a deadline. <laughs> Same team, Stan Sakai, great letterist. And then he did Usagi Yojimo, which is a very popular comic, you know. And uh, Tom Luth did the coloring. And Mark and I did the rest. Hmm. But uh, so we, we're still doing it. Still doing it's it. Fun. <laughs> it's great fun. Great fun. Well, with all the different publishers you had involved with Gru, did each want to put their own ideas in, or do they just leave you alone uh, to do your job? Sergio, you bring the comic and that's it. Not one, huh. not, not one input in the 10 years. I mm. never met any of the publishers of Marvel. Marvel. No, <laughs> that's great. It, uh, yeah. The editors keep changing, but... Matt, uh, Evanier did really the editing of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the editors then did all that job that an editor does, you know, I mean, having it on time, putting here the, what it goes in what, but that, that group comic, that, that inside was never touched. We had in close that whatever they, if they need an alteration, they have to ask us. Even the the contract with they wanted to put Stanley presents. I said no. It, hmm. This is Sergio Aragonés, Gruda Wanderer. Nobody presents me. <laughs> and so that took a lot of arguing with the lawyers. But wow. we were, so. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. Well, you you've done you you mentioned barbarians and you mentioned with Conan and Tarzan. So you've had Gru being crossovers with Conan and with Tarzan. Now, now, is it do you have to run everything by their estates for storylines, or they left you alone also? They left me alone. But th this is very, before the crossovers. We had an idea with Mark because he knows so much about comics to do uh, as, uh, as, uh, three comics. One called Sergio Destroys DC, Sergio Massacres Marvel, and Sergio <laughs> Stumps Star Wars. DC loved it, Marvel loved it, and Star Wars loved it. <laughs> no input from any of them, nothing about it. But because Mark knows so much about comics and superheroes, we work on that together. You know, I wrote that plot. But huh. I have a, a, a respect for writers and creators. I will never do a crossover, said. But if I include myself and Mark in that crossover, that is not a, a real crossover. It's me in one dreaming about doing that with Tarzan and another getting so many drugs because I was at the hospital that they thought I was sick and I was totally crazy. And in the other one, uh, we went to the Marvel offices and they haven't, they haven't finished their work. So I says, I'm pretty fast. I will draw them all. So I sit to draw Marvel stories of all their characters with a, a, a character created by us, by Mark and I. And so they love the stories. DC like it. They came out at the same time. We never got any troubles that people at at, um, at the Star Wars, the funny part is all of them wanted their 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 caricatures in it. You know, the, the, the people who work on the movies, the people who are part of the of the company of Lucas, they, they went, oh, <laughs> this guy is very important. Can you put him in the comics? <laughs> so, sure. <laughs> so you put him in the in the crowds, you know. The, you know. <laughs> so it was, but they never had any any input about it. Mm -hmm. you know, they, oh. It was a lot of fun. We did it. They came out about the same time, huh. and they're very hard to get those issues. You know, it was uh, they are yeah. very highly collectible. So now I, I, they wanted Dark Horse has the right or had I don't know now the the rights to publish uh, Tarzan and Conan. So they wanted a a crossover. The first one was, was with Conan. Huh. And I says, well, I can do it because 
is a barbarian, so there's no problem there. It took me a year to come with a plot. I couldn't, oh. mm. because Conan couldn't beat Gru. <laughs> Gru couldn't beat Conan. <laughs> so I couldn't do it, you know, I, I was just completely, and I keep thinking and thinking, you know, how, how can I do the comic? Of course, they were going to be an inclusion of Mark and I, because I don't want to do a story that a, a fan of Tarzan or a, or a fan of Conan will get insulting that I am making a humor or a, sure. I'm making a humor with us in it, like we did before. Mm -hmm. So that breaks the two authors. I'm, I'm using them <laughs> in the right, you know, adding an extra element in the right, but is is just a, a, a humorous thing. So I figured it out. One day I'm watching TV and it's an old movie. I love Japanese movies. And uh, uh, there it is, uh, Rashomon, a great movie mm -hmm. by Kurosawa. And there's something happens and three participants tell the stories differently. I says, that's it. I'm going to do the story of Conan by people saying that they saw Conan beating Gru in one issue and another. I saw <laughs> Gru beating this, you know, and they are just guys trying to get up free beers and things. So I included that part that three separate individuals tell the story and it worked great. great and then great. when you get yeah. to Tarzan, I included myself thinking that I was Tarzan, you know, thinking, oh my God, because I love Tarzan. And I get lost on a, on a, on a park and it's a very funny crossover. I love mm -hmm. it. It was a great time drawing because we have the system for both books with uh, Thomas Yates, which does the Prince Valiant story for the comics, for the, the comics uh, strips. And uh, he did the Tarzan and he drew the Conan. I did the, 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 the layouts of the pages, but left the Tarzan and the Conan for Tommy H to draw it his way. I just said what it was. And when the page came back, I made Guru to proportion it so the eyes could beat when they needed, you know. So it was a back and forth and it worked. I read I read the Tarzan one again last night. It was very funny. Still, <laughs> well, over the, over the years, there's been talk about turning Gru into an animated series. Is there any word on that? Well, the the rights are sold to a guy. Hmm. For, they have a certain time, and they are doing it. Mm -hmm. They have had very, very good results, so it's in the process. It was sold before many years ago as um uh, and uh, for a, as a movie and uh, the gentleman couldn't sell it and his time passed you know so i figured oh i'm going to make very good money just selling the rights and nobody making it and then I would sell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. there's there are careers based on that in based hollywood that. actually <laughs> yes <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> but, but no 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 we have a, a very good team now those people are love our group fans and they are really doing a very good thing but we cannot talk because i don't like to talk about something <laughs> that is not tangible you know until it is done because I've seen a lot of guys saying, we're doing an animation thing and they <laughs> talk about it and nothing happened. And, oh my God. That's okay. no, no, no. Until I sign a contract. Sure. Then so, I talk a lot about it. You know? <laughs> well, you, well, well, you've been doing group for 40 years now, around. So what, what are the plans for the future moving forward for group? I will continue to draw in group. I love to draw. It's my life. You know, I love the stories. <laughs> and Mark is still helping. And uh, Stan Sakai, who has now a television series with Usagi, has a television series, has a total business with all the countries and that. And he's still lettering for me because he's a dear friend. 
<laughs> you know, so he does the lettering. Tom Luth, sadly, he can't, uh, he, do, he didn't want to continue because uh, the coloring thing, and he does other things. But we have a very good uh, new colorist, you know, she's mm -hmm. terrific, Carrie Stratton. And she colored some things in MAD. So when Tom uh, couldn't do it anymore, I asked her if she could color for us, and she said yes. And she's done a great job. Yeah. Great, great yeah. job. I'm still, right now, I'm penciling a, a, a page. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Page. I'm, I just finished a, a, a cover. I, I just uh, I did put a what's the idea already? What's, I have to scan it. They haven't seen it either. So wow! This is a, a cover of. A, oh, that's of fantastic! A, that is fantastic. A, yes. You know, with all the details. So yes, the, amazing. Things. And uh, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> so. Yes. That, that, and uh, so this uh, page is finished uh, of uh, that is uh, another four page <laughs> with all the soldiers running away from group. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. Thank you well, for sharing that with us. God, yeah. I know. We feel so privileged to get a little sneak peek of something. <laughs> my gosh. So I'm, I'm, I have, with a pandemic outside, you know, my, my daughter and her husband are taking care of us. You know, they have their own apartment at the top of the house, you know, so they, they, I don't have to go out. Anything I need, they do for us. And I planning to go to Comic Con this time. So be be right. my first time in two years to go out. Wow. Well, well, I go out in the, right, right. I, I run <laughs> in the back, you know, and do. <laughs> I walk a little, you know, it's, uh, I still do exercises, you know, so it's fun. <laughs> well, we, we have to talk about um, your Eisner Award, which you were, uh, which you received in 1992, which is the top award in your field. Um, how satisfying was that for you to be recognized that way? Well, it was in many ways because I was not only uh, n nominated the, the, the first time for, for it, I was not a comic strip artist, which are basically what the National Cartoon Society was before. And the majority of them in the beginning were all the comic strip artists, the, the top of the of the the top of the top, the creme de la creme. And when they they nominated me, I never thought I was going to, to win it at all. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, I told my wife, uh, you don't even, that, that was on the South in a beautiful uh, NCS meeting. And I said, you don't even have to go. I'm not going to win it at all because the chances are, is a no, 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 no way. So I went, my to see on everything. And I was outside when they, they thought that I was the winner. <laughs> so <laughs> what? <laughs> I, they had to go and pick me up and bring me in. I was talking to a couple of cartoonists, which is a great opportunity to NCS to see all your friends. <laughs> so I went there and they gave it to me. And the first thing I said is, this, oh, shit, my wife is going to kill me. <laughs> that was, that was my, my acceptance speech. Because <laughs> I was totally flabbergasted and I, I got too emotional because it, it was never expected. You know? mm. uh, it was fantastic so i it's a great award you know it's, well deserved uh, well going speaking of emotional going back to mad magazine a couple of years ago they stopped their usual format and went into like reprints how is that for you to have like you know such an, a cultural institution that you played such a big part of like you know no longer around the same way well all my friends are going away too you know my mm -hmm. all the people i love Elder, except Al Jaffe, who is this month he'll be a hundred and two. Oh, yeah. So mm. it's 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 logical. Everything has a beginning and an end. No, no, it didn't. It it didn't uh, feel bad. You know, it was logical. The readership has changed, mm -hmm. and the the thing they do in Mad now 
if I was a young man or somebody, I will buy it because it has a lot of reprints from all the things. And nobody collects, there's some collectors, but the majority of read don't collect it. So the new issues have a lot of the old ones and the less older ones, mm -hmm. you know? So I know that they, they don't have anything new except the cover and a couple of things. But economics have also to, to have changed. The magazine have changed hands too, you know, companies by companies. And the people that were in charge are not in charge anymore because they were left with the, the other company. It's a, it's a way of the business. And you have to understand that. And uh, I, I did pretty good with mad. I loved it and uh, I, I miss my friends. Of course I miss my friends. I miss the routine of having to thin gags and submit them and see them in print. But uh, I miss a lot of things in life too that I cannot do anymore. <laughs> so well, regard uh, regarding those years at MAD, what would you say stands out to you the most? And, uh, First, the, the, the fact that I was working in the top magazine of humor. <laughs> Second, the bad trips. Bill Gaines took us to trips every year, all over the world. African mm -hmm. safaris, Morocco, Spain. I organized the one in Mexico. I went there a week before and I planned the whole thing. That was fantastic. So those trips were because we had roommates. I was roommates with Al Jaffe, with Jack Davis, oh. with Rojas, and suddenly they're sleeping in the next bed, you know, and it, it, they are more than colleagues. They are dear, dear friends, you know, and uh, you having drinks with them and eating with them. It, it was a camaraderie that I doubt very much that exists in any other organization ever. Mm -hmm the friendship and the, the going to these trips. We went by buses, we were in Morocco. The back of the bus was full of beer, wine, bread, salamis, cheeses, hams. So you could eat at all the trip and we went to see things. It was just amazing, amazing. The hotels in Africa, the safaris in your cars, you know, everything, it, it's, it's been, it's, it's indescribable. Uh, there's a few books written about it by um, Big De Bartolo wrote a very nice book. If you have a chance to read it, it's mm -hmm. an excellent book on, on MAD. There's a lot of work about it, but it will never be described with the reality of a 60 year friendship. Sure. That is not only a collaboration in art, uh, exchange of ideas about what humor is and the laughter of the meetings and the reunions that is, is an intangible that makes a life wonderful more than anything else so an, a bad experience cannot be described how do how, how, how you describe that sure. eating mm. with them having breakfast, sleeping in the same room, waking up and seeing uh, Jack Davis in his underwear, looking at the Matterhorn, <laughs> going with a, with a little whiskey going, Georgia, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is, you know, your mind just explodes in, a, in wonderful memories, you know. Well, you, you mentioned all the names you mentioned, but with yourself included, such legendary figures in the business. I mean, do do current cartoonists like reach out to you and tell you what an influence you were to them? Some, yes, the, the, the guys who work in humor, very much. I go to the to the to the conventions, and I talk to the people who are in line, you know. And uh, many have said that uh, they have become cartoonists because they love the, my work. And mm -hmm. the advantage is that the type of humor I do is very popular in other countries. I went to Malaysia and uh, in Turkey, I went to Turkey and there's a whole group of cartoonists who do comics who love my work. 
and they draw like me. You know, so it's not <laughs> great, you know. Wait a minute. And they have great cartoonists in Turkey and all over the place you go, they, you have a set of fans. Like on the other cartoonists, you know, it's uh, it's not unique of me, it's unique of everybody. They, they have their fans because they love the style, like I did my fans. I love a, an Argentina cartooning called Oski, because when I was a kid, I wanted to draw like him. And I, I drew the eyes like he did next to the nose. And, and when I met him in Luca in a convention, I was fanboy number one, you know, meeting my idol. <laughs> And he went, oh my God, that's Otto Soglo. And then I met Otto Soglo, who did The Little King, which was my favorite cartoon when the comic strips, you know, because he didn't have words at all. And it was so simple with The Little King with the, the most. I met him at the NCS and we had dinner together. Wow. And Rube Goldberg, I have originals them. I look at them. Uh, and, and Sparky Schultz invited me every year to, to go to his... Uh, uh, wonderful Christmas uh, oh, time at the thing. So they're my friends. He, Sparky used to come to my studio. I had a studio right here in downtown. I live in Ojai, which is a small town in California. And he, his wife came to here. They, they has a, a, a spa type of health place. And his son will drive them. And then Sparky will call me and says, I'm here. So he'll come to my studio and sat over there, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had to hide, to hide all the uh, um, uh, Garfields that I have around because he didn't like Garfield. Oh, so just, <laughs> Sparky's coming here. Where I put, oh, this is another, another Garfield here. I put it over there. <laughs> put more sn Snoopies around, you know. <laughs> but he was a dear, dear friend too. You know? So it's. It's a very sensitive family. And when you meet your idols, that's indescribable. And I had the chance to do. That's I, great. I, people that, when you're a kid, you look at the work and you had the chance to meet them. That's that nobody, very few people can say that in any field. That, uh, and I did. So probably that's my greatest. <laughs> pleasure that I have besides family, of course, is that I had a chance to meet all my idols, hmm. and the new ones that I met, like oh. Dave, like Jaffe, you know. Yeah. Where, you mentioned the Comic-Con, where, where will you be appearing next? Comic-Con. Which one? <laughs> the next one, which is whatever this... it is, I haven't even looked at the calendar. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it'll be in San Diego. And, uh, oh, San Diego when you go? That's a drive. Well, you, you mentioned talking to, you know, your idols, and this is what we got to do today. So we want to thank you so much. We're both huge fans. And like I said, I've, I've been reading Groove since the beginning and mad before that. And it was just such an absolute pleasure getting to talk to you and uh, getting to hear all your stories. So it's, uh, it is fun. It is fun. And then any time you'd like to come back, you're more than welcome. We'd love to have you. Well, again, this is, I'm Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman. This has been Pop Culture Goodbye. Retro. And again, a very special thanks to Sergio Aragones. And please, subscribe. Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast. 